I'm Andrew Zali. I'm the chief impact officer of an organization called Planet. Uh, I will just tell you two important things about us. One, one is we are one of the early publicly traded, now publicly traded, public benefit corporations that you were just hearing about. Um, I might mention just as a practical thing, one of the things that being a publicly traded PBC does for us is it changes the assumptions on the other side of the table when you want to collaborate across all of the kind of distinctions between public sector and private sector. And if, if it did nothing else uh, than that, in addition to all the great things you heard Susan team talking about, it would be well worth it. Um, the other thing I have to tell you is I have a bit of a cold, so I don't have COVID, I just checked 100%, but I do sound a little bit more like the godfather today. So I'm gonna be talking to you about ESG from space and, you know, the garbage removal industry. So um, what I'd love to do today is share with you uh, a little story about where those of us who are not in the finance sector, but are in the technology sector, are going to be joining up with you to advance the extraordinary global movement that everyone in this room represents. In order to do that, I just want to tell you, I'll start way back. We're going to talk a little bit about satellites and data and space and things like that. But before we do, it's worth noting that entirely through the history of the entire history of finance is just riven all the way through with the story of technology. This is an, an engraving from the 1850s of Wall Street. And you can see all the telegraph wires that even as people were wearing big poofy dresses and wonderful they have much better style, I think, than we did. But the thing that's amazing is you can just see how we move technology to a point where it connects, right? And it's not just about more information. It's also about the velocity of information, the time value of information. And it's been that way from the beginning. You know, we have major financial institutions became major financial institutions in part because they financed the communications infrastructure that would allow them to detect signals ahead of their competitors or detect signals that no competitor in principle could hear. And in fact, we get that not just in finance, but in every domain of life. These magical devices were used to listen for the first signs of inbound air raids in World War I before we invented radar. People would just stand there with their ears like this all day long, listening for the first signs of change. So the story of technology and the story of finance are intimately linked, as all of you know. But there's a kind of interesting philosophical, for all of that wonderful story, and I could show you a thousand examples of that over the history of, of finance. For all of this, there is a huge blind spot. And that blind spot is that, you know, ever since uh, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, there have been some fundamental precepts in global capitalism and global capital markets. One of the most basic is that nature is hyperabundant, self-replenishing, and free. And so you don't have to think about it measuring it. So we don't build technologies like this to measure stuff, to measure the treasure, as my friend Andy Karsner likes to say. And because we don't measure it, we don't value it. And because we don't value it, we don't build the measurement systems to measure it. And on and on and on and on. And that leads to a weird situation where, like today, you have an organization like Amazon, which is measured to a, I don't know, a thousandth of a penny a billion times a day. And the actual Amazon, for which it's named, has no intrinsic economic value at all until the trees are cut down and the forests are cleared and they're turned into productive assets. Right? So there's no sense of the valuation of that system. So how do we move past that? Right? How do we begin to take all of this material, deeply material information? Because while that might have been true, perhaps, in Adam Smith's state, it's certainly not true now. 
How do we begin to put a value in all of those things, the material, non-financial information? And today, it's really complicated. Just to quote the man himself, right? It is a messy world as we're beginning to try to figure out how do you regularize, how do you systematize the kinds of ingestion of information into the global financial system that really tell us about the state of the world in a really deep way. And that's what our organization's about. So most of the, this is a story quickly about satellites. As you may know, satellites that look at the Earth are often the size of school buses. They cost hundreds of millions to billions of dollars to design and build. They take decades of planning. And a young group of NASA engineers said, if we just work at this pace, we'll get to work on two or three of these in our entire lifetime. And they did this really interesting thing. They went down to Best Buy. They bought a stack of off-the-shelf Android smartphones. They took the guts out of the phone. They built a tiny little satellite you could hold in the palm of your hand, because that's you can, what you can do when you're a NASA engineer. They built a tiny little satellite, and they secretly gave it to one of the astronauts who's headed to the International Space Station and asked her to throw it out the airlock when she got there to see how your phone would do in space. And they were busted just before it happened and nearly fired. Not of them lost, actually lost their job. They did this mission, but they did it. They built a satellite that has a lot of the instruments that the big instruments have in a tiny little package for a few thousand dollars. And it created a revolution in the way we design satellites. Now, organizations like Planet are the inheritors of that work. We've built hundreds and hundreds of these very small instruments that are about the size of a loaf of bread. And we've put them in a giant ring around the Earth. So you can imagine, you're the sun, here's the Earth, it's spinner. I don't know if you remember kindergarten. Okay, the Earth goes like this. Okay, it goes around an annual basis, is on a slight tilt. And this is a group of hundreds of satellites that spin from pole to pole. Each one is a camera, and as the Earth turns sideways underneath them, we collectively image the entire surface of the Earth every day at about three meters per pixel. We're not reading your newspaper. We're not spying on you. We're not interested in that. What we're interested in is change, because this allows us to see every field, every forest, every facility, everywhere, every day. And when you extract using the tools of machine learning and computer vision, <clears throat> these essential patterns, you can see all kinds of things on the Earth. Here, for instance, are just a few months of deforestation deep in the Amazon sped up. Now, <clears throat> if you look on the right-hand side of the screen, you can literally watch deforestation. We lose 40 football fields uh, of old-growth forest a minute on Earth. We've lost hundreds while I've been speaking in just these last few minutes. Now, what you might see and your eye goes to is what's on the right there which is the loss of deforestation. If you know who owns those assets, those forests, you know when they've been deforested. And there is no way to avoid being seen now. So the problem with the global ESG movement has historically been that it's a kind of dog's breakfast of scraps of information and everyone's trying to harmonize these in, you know, inconsistent data sets and inconsistent reports. Well, we're about to get really transformational, global, consistent, daily, continuous data sets that will allow us to truly compare apples to apples and see how people are doing. There's a lot of work to do here, but it's just the beginning. Now, the other side of this, though, that's worth noting is what happens on this screen, on the left-hand side of the screen, just after the deforestation occurs. Some of you will see these little spider webs appear on the left-hand side. Those are the illegal roads that go in before the next round of deforestation occurs. That's not the signal of change that's happened. It's the signal of change that is just about to happen. And we're working with organizations around the world who are watching now and saying, there shouldn't be a road going in there. We're going to send people in. And literally, they smash the equipment. That's what those law enforcement people do. So this is a hugely powerful new tool. Um, the people that I work with are brilliant. They're rocket scientists. They literally, in our organization, say, they don't say it's not rocket science. They say it's just rocket science. Um, but what we are not is we are not you. We're not financiers. We're not, we, do, we are understand, beginning to understand how do we embed these kinds of tools in the, in the financial system in a way that they can be broadly shared sources of truth across all the sectors. So what we're doing is we're taking the data at the bottom and we're extracting from it what we call essential planetary variables. Where is all the water, the carbon, the biodiversity, the biomass, the agriculture, the roads, the buildings, the bridges? 
all of that stuff. And then with partners, we're beginning to extract essential information for our shared journey. And I'll give you one example. <laughs> we work very closely with this organization called Climate Trace. It's a coalition of technological organizations that take that stack of imagery that I just showed you, all that stuff, and they, <clears throat> they do a really interesting thing. They use the same tools that Google uses to tell you whether or not it's a cat or a dog, to tell you whether or not a coal-fired power plant is in operations on a given day by watching the steam that comes out of the stack and the water discharge. And uh, then they feed that information into a machine learning model that allows them to extract. And I, I, I don't know if you guys in the back, can you actually make the video go? I'm, I think it's a little stuck. This is just a quick demonstration of their work, if we, can, uh, if we can get it to play. There you go. And what they're doing is they're mapping the emissions. They, they estimate the emissions that come out of those plants, not just for one plant, but for every plant on Earth, that little black line you see, that little squiggle, that's the emissions story. And it's not reported anywhere on Earth. Uh, about 60%, we have no idea where these plants are operating or how much they're operating, how much carbon they're putting into the atmosphere. And now we're beginning to get that kind of information. Um, let me see if I can go forward. <laughs> the, um, the thing that's coming behind that is a breakthrough new instrument from Planet and NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, supported by Bloomberg and by a host of really extraordinary organizations and, um, and the state of California, which will do pinpoint methane emissions detection down to the individual facility level. So we can look down and say, it's this cattle processing plant, it's this landfill, it's that oil and gas facility with precision. And while, why do we want to see that? Well, if we can make detecting those emissions incredibly cheap, we can make ignoring them incredibly expensive. So being a PBC with the kind of presumption of good intent that, we, that right now it, it brings us allows us to collaborate with policymakers and with uh, philanthropists and with technology organizations and with governments to build these kinds of infrastructures. And we are creeping every day closer and closer to you. Now, I have to tell you, I just looked down at the clock. I have 10 seconds left, so I can't share any of my other amazing slides, but I would love to talk with you about all the things that we've got going on. But the most important thing is, you know, I, I was at, uh, like many of you, I was probably in Glasgow last November. And I think we saw the limits of the international system's ability to agree their way to climate change. Right? We just saw the boundary condition. This is, if you can't even get all the emitters to show up, okay, that's, the, that's about as far as the international order can go. Well, the thing I want to say to you is that there was one really important part of that story, though, because you could see them turning and saying, okay, now it's time for technology and finance, the two big systems drivers, to come in and deliver this kind of work. So I'm incredibly excited about this fortuitous moment because we have bigger problems than we have ever, have ever imagined before, but we also have better tools than we really understand. And this is just one of them among a bunch of others. The other thing I want to just say to you is that an important part of the conversations today, especially, have continually touched upon just transition. Um, we think of data in lots of different ways. One of the most important ways to think about it is as, is as unrefined social power. So how we distribute those assets in society, how we ensure that broad publics benefit. And it's a weird story, and it's, you know, because the world isn't even. What you have is you have some people, you know, in a given society, you might have a very small minority of extraordinarily super empowered people and a very large uh, group of people who are uh, marginalized in terms of their social power. And if you just go out and give all the data away, you can hyper empower the already powerful and only marginally improve the position of the already marginal and increase the difference between them. So we have to be really thoughtful about how we distribute these things as public goods. And one of the other things that we're able to do as a PBC, as a public benefit corporation, is focus on how we design those public goods so that not only are we building the kind of triggers for finance, but we're also creating the kinds of movements for, for social equity and inclusion that are going to be essential for making the world a better place. So anyway, thank you very much. It's terrific. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Have a great conference. <laughs>